buckle up this morning, as we're starting Romans 9, and uh, I discovered the perils of preaching Romans 9 not too long after my conversion as a young pastor. Uh, after growing up in the church for over 25 years, the very first time I read this chapter in a small group setting, uh, a good portion of the small group were very upset. <laughs> I was surprised at the anger and vitriol it brought out. And then the, when the, I first preached this chapter, more than one person attending the church boldly announced that is, if this is who God is, I wouldn't worship Him. Romans is a good way to trim the church down. And, and Romans 9 is one of the most offensive chapters for those who do not understand who God is. And so, let's remind ourselves as we read that this is the Word of God and that we are submitting ourselves to His Word. We don't know anything about God except for what His Word reveals to us. If anyone claims to know God but does not know God through His Word, they are a liar. Nobody has special revelation of God outside of His Word. No one has had God reveal some aspect of His character to them that is not in His Word. This is how we know the character of God. And so follow along as we read, and as we tackle Romans 9 through 11 till probably almost Christmas, I hope you'll have plenty of time to read this and meditate on it yourself. Let's read Romans chapter 9, verse 1. I am speaking the truth in Christ. I am not lying. My conscience bears me witness in the Holy Spirit that I have great sorrow and unceasing anguish in my heart. For I could wish that I myself were accursed and cut off from Christ for the sake of my brothers, my kinsmen, according to the flesh. They are Israelites, and to them belong the adoption, the glory, the covenants, the giving of the law, the worship, and the promises." To them belong the patriarchs, and from their race, according to the flesh, is the Christ, who is God over all, blessed forever. Amen. But it is not as though the word of God has failed. For not all who are descended from Israel belong to Israel, and not all are children of Abraham, because they are his offspring, but through Isaac shall your offspring be named." This means that it is not the children of the flesh who are the children of God, but the children of the promise are counted as offspring. For this is what the promise said, about this time next year I will return and Sarah shall have a son. And not only so, but also when Rebekah had conceived children by one man, our forefather Isaac, though they were not yet born and had done nothing, either good or bad, in order that the purpose of God's, or sorry, God's purpose of election might continue, not because of works, but because of him who calls, she was told, the older shall serve the younger. As it is written, Jacob I loved, but Esau I hated. What shall we say then? Is there injustice on God's part? By no means. For he says to Moses, I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy, and I will have compassion on whom I have compassion. So then, it depends not on human will or exertion, but on God who has mercy. For the Scripture says to Pharaoh, For this very purpose I have raised you up, that I might show my power in you, and that my name might be proclaimed in all the earth. So then, he has mercy on whomever he wills, and he hardens whomever he wills. You will say to me then, Why does he still find fault? For who can resist his will? But who are you, O man, to answer back to God? Will what is molded say to its molder, Why have you made me like this? Has the potter no right over the clay to make out of the same lump one vessel for honorable use and another for dishonorable use? If, what if God, desiring to show his wrath and to make known his power, has endured with much patience vessels of wrath prepared for destruction in order to make known the riches of his glory for vessels of mercy, which he has prepared beforehand for glory? Even us, whom he has called, not from the Jews only, but also from the Gentiles. As indeed he says in Hosea, those who were not my people, I will call my people. And her who was not beloved, I will call beloved. And in this very place where it was said to them, you are not my people, there they will be called sons of the living God. 
And Isaiah cries out concerning Israel, Though the number of the sons of Israel be as the sand of the sea, only a remnant of them will be saved. For the Lord will carry out his sentence upon the earth fully and without delay. As Isaiah predicted, if the Lord of hosts had not left us offspring, we would have been like Sodom and become like Gomorrah. What shall we say then? That Gentiles who did not pursue righteousness have attained it? That is, a righteousness that is by faith, but that Israel, who pursued a law that would lead to righteousness, did not succeed in reaching that law? Why? Because they did not pursue it by faith, but as if it were based on works. They have stumbled over the stumbling stone, as it is written, Behold, I am laying in Zion a stone of stumbling, and a rock of offense, and whoever believes in him will not be put to shame. This is the word of the Lord. As far as I can tell, uh, from what I have learned, uh, and I could be wrong, but as far as I can tell, there's two camps on Romans 9. Those who preach it and those who don't. There's not an Arminian sermon on this chapter because chapter 9 is so clearly acute regarding the doctrine of predestination and divine sovereignty, so much so that there is no avenue of escape from it. If someone would come up with a more palatable interpretation than what Paul is clearly stating, they would then have to account for the questions of shocked outrage in verses 14 and 19. Romans 9, 14, what shall we say then? Is there injustice on God's part? And verse 19, why does he still find fault? For who can resist his will? It is only when we are forced to ask ourselves these questions that we know that we are following Paul's logic correctly. If, if our interpretation of this chapter does not lead us to say, doesn't that mean there's injustice on God's part? And how can he still hold us accountable if no one can resist his will? Then we have not correctly understood what Paul is laying down. Finding Paul's answers to these questions unsatisfactory, some have rejected the doctrine of God's sovereignty outright. They claim that a good God would do everything in his power to save precious human life, and so he must lack the capability to contend with human free will. Or he has allowed his hands to be tied in some sense, so that while doing his darndest to accomplish his will, it is outside of his ability to save all people. The sentiment is that if God is good, he must be on our side. We contend that this God of their imagination, devoid of ultimate sovereign control over all things, cannot be genuinely good not in the sense of Scripture, we can only say he means well. That is to say that for God to be truly good, he must also be fully in control. Because God is consistently giving such amazing promises to his people, as we have just seen in abundance through chapter 8, he must, to be good, be fully willing and fully capable to carry them out. Anything less is not good well-meaning though it might be. One of the striking themes of chapter 8 is uh, that these abundant and amazing promises which were originally promised to Israel have now been granted to the multi-ethnic church. Israel was promised they would receive the Holy Spirit, Ezekiel 36, 26 to 27, so that they could keep the law. But this promise has come to pass in the church through the gift of the Holy Spirit, Romans 8.4. Israel has had the promise of a future resurrection, Ezekiel 37.13. But now Paul speaks of the resurrection of believers, Romans 8.11. Israel was God's son, Exodus 4.22. But now believers are sons and daughters of God and adopted as his own, Romans 8.16. The future inheritance was promised to Israel all through Isaiah 60 and, and other chapters, but now it is pledged to the church, Romans 8, 17. 
Israel was God's chosen people and the only people group foreknown among the nations, Amos 3.2. And yet now the church is said to be foreknown and chosen by God, Romans 8.29-30. God had promised he would never forsake Israel, Deuteronomy 31.6. Yet now this promise is extended to the church in Romans 8, 38, and 39. And so with the application of so many Old Testament promises to the church, with Gentiles now sharing in all the blessings that had previously belonged to Israel alone, what does this mean for the nation of Israel? Has their special place in God's plan simply been transferred to the church? Have they been separated from the love of God? Has God broken His promises to the Jews? And if so, how could we now trust His promises under the new covenant? These are the questions that Paul is answering in Romans 9 to 11. He takes us under the hood, so to speak, to clarify what it is that God is doing and how He is working out His plans in redemptive history. The entire section undergirds his thesis in verse 6. It is not as though the Word of God has failed. God's Word does not fail. But it doesn't always work out the way you or I might expect either. Whenever we're studying in Romans, there is a danger, especially as we work slowly through a couple verses at a time, as we're going to do this morning, that we miss the forest for the trees. This is Romans. There are some magnificent sequoias in here, some towering cedars. We've got predestination. We've got the sovereignty of God. We've got the state of of ethnic Israel and the promises being granted to the Gentiles. There there are some trees, but we don't want to miss the big picture. The central issue in these chapters is not predestination or even the salvation of Israel, but the question Are we in the church able to fully trust the promises that we have just received in chapters 5 to 8? That's the theme. That's the most important thing here. If you've been with us through Romans or if you've read it, there there are some amazing promises in the previous chapters that are all kind of given this stamp of certainty. Over and over again, Paul gives us this certainty. We know that if this has happened for us, we will also receive these other things. If we have the Spirit, we will be glorified. Can we take God at His word? At the forefront of Paul's thinking is God's faithfulness to His promises. Now, if we only had Romans 1 to 8 we might think that God had completely abandoned ethnic Israel with just all the ways that the the promises to ethnic Israel have been given to the church now. We might think that somehow God has divorced His people. Some at this time may have even accused Paul of abandoning ethnic Israel. Perhaps his law-free gospel was being portrayed as an utter abandonment of his people. And so in the first few verses of chapter 9, Paul shifts from the heights of celebration to the deepest of laments. In chapter 8, as we've just seen, there's a celebration of all that God has done for believers as they are adopted, granted the Holy Spirit and the law of God on their hearts, promised glory. But what can be said for ethnic Israel to whom all of these blessings were already promised? And we're not even going to answer that question this morning. This is just part one of getting there. So Romans 9, 1 to 3, Paul says, I am speaking the truth in Christ. I am not lying. My conscience bears me witness in the Holy Spirit that I have great sorrow and unceasing anguish in my heart, for I could wish that I myself were accursed and cut off from Christ for the sake of my brothers, my kinsmen, according to the flesh. We're going to move slow through verses 1 through 5 this morning. We're going to take a good look at some of the trees. But keep in mind the forest, right? The forest is God is faithful to His promise always. Now let's look at what Paul says about his people. As apostle to the Gentiles, 
and the bearer of the law-free gospel, Paul's loyalty to his own ethnic group should not be questioned. After celebrating the gracious gift of God to include the Gentiles into his covenant people, Paul once again reminds us that he has not left the the Jewish-Gentile issue that has dominated his letter. Remember, the, the Jews were cast out of Rome. They were sent into exile. And so what was a almost entirely Jewish church had now become, an, overnight essentially, an entirely Gentile church. And the Gentile church was booming. They were growing rapidly. And, and so very few Jews, after the initial number, came to receive Christ. And so this handful of Jews that had founded the church, now Christ was the founder of the church, but this, this group that was the, the initial members, they were now allowed after a number of years back into Rome, and now there's conflict. What have they done with our church? Maybe, maybe some of you older folks here this morning can, can relate to this. What have they done with our church? They worship in a different way. They eat completely different food. They're dressed in in an entirely different way. All their mannerisms are off. There's just nothing to connect them culturally. And so Paul is addressing this church that now has this conflict. And what should the Jewish members of the church be teaching and discipling these newer Gentile converts in? What should they teach them to do? How should they teach them to live? Should they have to wear this hat that I'm wearing? Should they, should they have to dress this way? Are they allowed to trim their beards? These are real questions that would come up in this church. So despite all the covenant faithfulness that had been shown to Israel, despite all the miraculous things God had done in Paul's life and the revival among the Gentiles, Paul's own people, though, continued to resist the gospel message and miss out on the fulfillment of the covenant promises God had made to their biological forefather, Abraham. And so the church was founded amongst these Jewish believers by a Jewish Messiah, and yet for the most part, there was a wholesale rejection of the gospel among the Jews. In fact, Now people seldom know this or realize this, but theirs was the earliest and strongest persecutions against the followers of Christ. The Jews were the first to imprison and kill Christians, and then they were also the ones who incited the Roman persecution against them. The Romans had no care about what religion you practiced. It was only as the Jewish people started to point out to the Romans that the Christians were such horrible people that the Romans began to persecute them. And then, when they gathered in the synagogue, part of the common liturgy was to pray curses upon the fledgling Christian church. We we have these today. They would pronounce imprecations, that is, prayers of cursing, on the Christians and on Christ. And then Paul himself suffered violently at their hands many times. And so in what seems like an outrageous statement that doesn't seem to follow, Paul states that he would be willing to be damned, cut off from Christ, even to trade his salvation for the sake of his fellow Jews. This is the love of God at work in his apostle. If he could bring about the salvation of his people by losing his, he would do it. Now, he's already pointed out in his last statement, his very last statement before this, nothing will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. And so Paul clearly states here that even his own choosing could not do this, which is amazing. So Paul's saying, if I could, I would, but of course I can't. Nothing can separate us from the love of God. Paul's sentiments are not unique. They're reminiscent of Exodus 32, 31 to 33, where Moses ascends the mountain of the Lord with the intent of offering himself as an atoning sacrifice for Israel. So Moses, verse 31, returned to the Lord and said, Alas, this people has sinned a great sin. They have made for themselves gods of gold. But now, if you will forgive their sin, but if not, please blot me out of your book that you have written. 
But the Lord said to Moses, whoever has sinned against me, I will blot out of my book. And both Paul and Moses model something here that Jesus himself demonstrated in his obedience even to death on a cross. A willingness to bear whatever the cost might be, whatever is demanded to lead people to God and to keep them close to him. There is suffering involved, church, in genuinely caring for people. Suffering with Christ, Romans 8, 17, which is the requirement for all those who would also be glorified with him. There is a cost to caring for, a cost to correcting and restoring fellow believers. We incur an emotional and relational cost at the very least when we genuinely love the people of God. To be known by God and to experience all of the blessing that comes with that relationship and then to watch those we know live without Christ will inevitably cause agonizing sorrow. That is, if we have genuinely experienced true relationship with God and then we see those we love and those around us who have not experienced this, this will cause us to agonize. And such sorrow and anguish should cause us to pray and then do everything we can, including making opportunities to share our witness, anything to help them come to Christ. How do you feel about relatives, friends, and co-workers who do not know the Lord? What are we willing to give up for them to be saved? Do some of our family and friends not know the Lord because we are not willing to sacrifice our time, money, and energy to reach them with the gospel? Do they not know Christ because we have refused to risk our relationship with them so that they could have a relationship with God? You know, we we can sometimes use our own wisdom rather than the wisdom of God and say, well, I I don't want to break off relationship with that person. I don't want to harm our our lovely family atmosphere here by sharing the truth with this person. What are we willing to lose? Paul says if if we're possible, he would lose his salvation for these people. Now, I confess to you, church, I don't feel that much love for anybody, but... (laughs) We certainly are called to love in a greater way here as we pattern our lives after Jesus and Paul as he follows Christ. Now, Paul's agony over the failure of the Jews to come to salvation is not merely his cultural connection or the fact that they are his biological relatives, but the tragic nature of their condemnation despite all the benefits they had received. Romans 3, 1 to 2, he writes, What advantage has the Jew? And then later, much in every way. Romans 9, 4 to 5, they are Israelites. And to them belong the adoption, the glory, the covenants, the giving of the law, the worship, and the promises. To them belong the patriarchs, and from their race, according to the flesh, is the Christ, who is God over all, blessed forever. Amen. This is why the current state of the people of Israel was so tragic. Look at all they had been given. And yet the vast majority still missed out on a right relationship with God. You know, I I can think about all the people I know who, who grew up in church and had the benefit of owning a Bible, Sunday school, even Bible college, and still missed out on a right relationship with God. What a tragedy. We can have all of the outward superficial symbols of belonging to God and still be estranged from Him. To reject the gospel is to be rejected by God. And so these verses explain why Israel's failure is theologically significant because as God's elect people, His covenant people, they were recipients of His special affection and care throughout history. And they were promised His saving righteousness in the future. And so thus their failure to realize these saving promises is all the more agonizing, particularly because it calls into question the faithfulness of God. 
I want to break it down just a little bit. They, it says they are Israelites. Well, even this term, Israel, generally designates the special relationship that they had with God. It was the preferred self-designation for Israel in contrast to Jew, which was the term outsiders used to describe Israelites. So Jewish people did not refer to each other as Jews. They referred to each other as Israelites. They were Israelites. Other people referred to them as Jews. And so this title sums up all of the other privileges mentioned. When someone claims to be an Israelite, they are saying, all of these blessings are mine. All of these promises are mine. These covenants are mine. To be an Israelite was to be a part of God's elect people. Theirs is the adoption to sonship. Now, in in the Old Testament, the Israelites are called God's son. And the nation of Israel is called his firstborn son. No other nation can be said to possess the glory of God, the radiant pillar of cloud and fire which led them through the wilderness and then came to rest over the mercy seat in the middle of the temple. The Jews possessed the law, a rule of ethics that was no invention of men. God himself uttered the commandments and wrote them with his own finger on tablets of stone. And then through Israel, the Ten Commandments have been given to the world laying the foundational legal structure for all of Western civilization, but they were first given to Israel. Theirs was the worship. God provided Israel alone with clear directions on how to worship and how to approach Him in a way in which their sins could be forgiven and that they wouldn't die, and a system that foreshadowed the sacrifice of Christ on the cross by which alone sins could be truly removed. And with the sacrificial system also came instructions for prayer and instructions for right understanding about who God is so that they could worship Him rightly and truly. Only to Israel was this granted of all the nations. No one was stumbling upon this information. No one was inventing the right way to worship God. No one could imagine the true God. This was all granted to Israel. The promises... And the promises, promises of redemption, promises of inheritance, all of the promises of the world came to and were mediated through Israel. This is all part of the heritage of the Jewish people. Israel was the fountainhead of world salvation. Salvation is of God, but it comes through Israel. R.C. wrote, A Christian cannot think of himself as being cut off from the Old Testament. It records the history of redemption culminating in the appearance of Jesus Christ. Abraham is the father of the faithful. Isaac is a patriarch of the covenant. Jacob is the father of the twelve tribes. Moses, the mediator of the law. David gives us the Psalms. Jeremiah speaks of the new covenant. Isaiah prophesies of the coming Messiah. All the great heroes and heroines of the faith, Hebrews 11, that are such a rich part of Christian heritage are Jewish. Our Lord Jesus. Jesus was a Jew. Here, Paul refers to the glorious dual nature of Jesus, who according to his human ancestry came from Israel, but at the same time, he is the Christ who is God over all, blessed forever. Amen. And when Jesus is rejected, It is not only the promised Messiah that the Jews have rejected, but they have rejected God himself. Now, already in Romans, many of these benefits have already been associated with believers, including the Gentile believers, the covenant promises, even adoption as sons of God, and the ability to claim Abraham as our father, Romans 4.16. So by applying most of these benefits to all believers, Paul is not denying the relationship of these benefits to Israel's heritage. Rather, Gentiles who submit to Israel's God-ordained king are grafted into the covenant, whereas Jews who rebel against him 
are broken off. It is not the covenant that has changed. And this will become all the more clear in Romans 11, but it's made clear again in Ephesians 2, 11 to 15. Therefore remember that at one time you Gentiles in the flesh called the uncircumcision by what is called the, the circumcision, that is the Jews, which is made by in the flesh by hands, remember that you were at one time separated from Christ, alienated from the commonwealth of Israel, and strangers to the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. But now, in Christ Jesus, you who were once far off, have been brought near by the blood of Christ. For he himself is our peace, who has made us both one, and has broken down in his flesh the dividing wall of hostility, by abolishing the law of commandments expressed in ordinances, that he might create in himself one new man in place of two, so making peace. Gentile believers, like most of us here, should remember that we were at one time separated from Christ. But those who were once alienated from Israel have become citizens. The strangers to the covenant have become sons. The hopeless have been brought near and made into one body by the finished work of Christ. There is no replacement of Israel by the Gentile church. Let it never be said. Gentile believers are grafted into Israel by the untold grace of God, as Paul will make abundantly clear and has in Ephesians and will again in chapter 11. This is important teaching, church. It is important that you recognize the Old Testament is the story of your people. It is important that you recognize that the promises of Abraham are yours by faith through Christ. It is important for you to know who you are and the great status that has been freely granted, one that you were not born into and one that you do not deserve. Paul's sorrow over his people, according to the flesh, his ethnic group, it is not merely a keen sense of ethnic identity with his people. He grieves because ethnic Israel has been the beneficiary of God's goodness in the past and was promised a glorious future. And these promises do not seem like they have come to pass. And so they call into question God's righteousness. The rest of Romans 9 to 11 deals with this problem. So we're not going to come to a solution this morning. The rest of the chapters here deal with this problem raised in relation to Paul's gospel by the fact that the majority of the Jews of his day were rejecting it. If the gospel is God's word to Israel, then it would appear that God's word has failed. And Paul responds by reminding those in the Roman churches that, in fact, some Jews had responded negatively, while others had responded positively in accord with the way God has always exercised His divine sovereign choice. It is not as though the Word of God has failed. In, in Romans 8 and 9, Paul emphasizes God's electing will, which sees to it that His promises are always effectively secured. But it would be a, a serious misreading to understand this in a fatalistic way that undermines human responsibility. And Gentiles were streaming into the church, and Jews were being excluded because of divine election. Yes, that is true. Yet at the same time, the same reality can also be perceived from another complementary standpoint. Gentiles were entering the people of God because they exercised faith in Jesus as Messiah, whereas Jews did not place their faith in Christ because they failed to see that He was the fulfillment to which the Old Testament law pointed, and because they tried to establish their own righteousness based on works instead of trusting in God's saving righteousness. And Paul emphasizes all along that salvation is equally accessible to Jews and Gentiles by faith, and yet, despite having ample opportunity to, 
opportunity to believe in all the blessings of God, Israel has resisted God's offer of salvation because of their obstinance. Now, this was all according to the plan and purpose of God, Paul says. He predestined it. The Scriptures, Old Testament and New, teach that human freedom operates under the umbrella of divine sovereignty. Now, very seldom do any of the writers make any attempt to explain philosophically how God's sovereign control over every detail of the world fits with human responsibility. Romans 9 through 11 is one of the rare times someone tries to explain it. But it is always assumed that since God is the creator, it is the nature of things that human freedom is subsumed under divine sovereignty. God made them. God knew how everything was going to work out. There's no getting away from the sovereignty of God. But in other words, the divine sovereignty does not cancel out the authenticity of human choices. But neither do human choices cancel out the plan and purpose of God. The very next verse, which we'll look at more closely next time, introduces the thesis, as I said, but it is not as though the Word of God has failed. Proverbs 19.21 says, Many are the plans in the mind of a man, but it is the purpose of the Lord that will stand. And God makes an astounding claim in Isaiah 55, 10 to 11. And I'll leave you with this. For as the rain and the snow come down from heaven and do not return there, but water the earth, making it bring forth and sprout, giving seed to the sower and bread to the eater, so shall my word be that goes out from my mouth. It shall not return to me empty, but it shall accomplish that which I purpose and shall succeed in the thing for which I sent it. This week, go back through Romans 8. Read the promises, the magnificent promises of God. And read them once again through the lens of Isaiah 55 and Proverbs 19 and Romans 9 through 11. My word, which goes out from my mouth, shall not return to me empty but it shall accomplish that which I purpose and shall succeed in the thing for which I sent it. We're speaking about the Creator here, the one who spoke and the universe came into existence. He has now called people righteous, and they will be so. He has called them saved, and it will be so. He has called them his own people, even though they once were not, and it will be so. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. I wasn't so bad. We all made it through. Nobody jumped up and screamed and ran out. Lord, I pray that you would continue to work on our hearts by your word. Prepare us for the rest of Romans 9 through 11. Help us to submit ourselves to you. But most of, God, of all, God, I, I want to communicate uh, as a body, as a church here gathered, we are so thankful for such amazing promises. We were not the right people group. We weren't the right people. We weren't doing the right things. We didn't know you. We didn't know how to worship you. And you called us to yourself by your mighty word. Sheer grace. Your mercy undeserved. And so we're so thankful to you. We give you praise. Amen.